Live from San Francisco, it's Channel 5's People Are Talking with Ann Fraser and Ross McGowan. Well, thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to People Are Talking. So if I were to say the phrase, and that's the way it is, who would you think of? Walter Cronkite. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome the most trusted man in America, Mr. Walter Cronkite. for being here. It's a delight to have you in San Francisco and it's, on our show. It's great to be with you. It's always wonderful to be in San Francisco, the world's favorite city. It is lovely, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You have been called the most trusted man in America. Is that a heavy burden? Well, it should be, I suppose, but it's not really because I think any journalist uh, carries a heavy burden of responsibility anyway. And uh, all journalists are trying to be trusted quite clearly. That's the name of the game. So uh, you, there's really, you can't put any heavier burden on than that that we all share. And that's, uh, that's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when you were a kid what you wanted to be? A journalist. You did as a kid? Yeah, I Not a dentist, out. huh? Uh, well, I started out obviously wanting to be a fireman yeah. and uh, <laughs> went on from there to aviator and a few other things. Uh, but, uh, but by the time I was uh, 13 years old, I, I wanted to be a newspaper man. I had heard that you wanted to be a mining engineer. Well, there was a brief flurry of that uh, excitement. <laughs> created, uh, naturally, I would want to be a mining engineer living in Houston, Texas, on top of one of the great oil domes of all the world. I'd want to, want to be a mining engineer. But the, uh, uh, it, that didn't last. That lasted through first year physics when I couldn't figure out how a pulley works. <laughs> I figured if you don't know how a pulley works, you ought to go down in a mine. <laughs> no, I really didn't take that very seriously. I asked you if, if you wanted to be a dentist because that, your father was a dentist, is that correct? My father, my grandfather, my uncle. My uncle on the other side of the family, actually. So mm -hmm. I was, we had a lot of dentists in the family, uh, and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> you never were drawn to that profession at all? No, not, not at all. And now you went to the University of Texas and dropped out your junior year. Yeah, Why? that's true. Because I was already uh, fully employed. I was working a, a full, full eight hours and more a day. Uh, helping to cover the state legislature in Austin, where the university is, uh, working for the United Press and Scripps Howard newspapers. And uh, uh, I, I was studying political science uh, at the university and also working there on the Daily Texan at, at night. Uh, and uh, uh, as I was studying political science, I found that my political science professors were asking me more questions about what was going on at the state capitol. <laughs> than I was asking them in class, and I didn't get to class too often. I was a very bad student, a uh, very poor student. I don't advise that for anybody. I've regretted it ever since. Did you go back for your degree? No. no we didn't get it but you worked for uh, United Press for a while. So for you 11, were in, 11 in, years. In, in the written part of journalism before yeah, broadcasting. I worked for newspapers for four years and mm -hmm. United Press for 11, so I had 15 years of newspapering and press service work. Before now, during World War II, you worked primarily in London? During the, before we got onto the continent, I was in London uh, the, throughout uh, for the United Press, and my main assignment was covering the air war, which was the big war out of London then. There wasn't any ground combat, of course, to cover, and uh, that was a very exciting three be. years, I can tell you that. And I, I flew the with the 8th Air Force and the RAF. The personalities you must have met during that time. Personalities? Well, George Patton. Oh, yes. Well, well, that was after we got on the continent. They had no in Patton. But uh, what uh, on, in the Air Force, Jimmy Stewart, of course, was, was a, one of the real heroes of, of the air war. And he, even today, uh, is shy about it. Although uh, he came over as colonel, leading a group of uh, flying fortress of liberators. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was a you know major combat job. He flew with them. He led the raids, uh, and he, for a long time, would not let a newspaper man onto his base because he did not want to uh, profit by by publicity in trying to do his war job. 
And we finally convinced him that he should let uh, us on his base because he was denying his own men any chance to get their names in the papers, uh, as well as keeping his own name out. Clark Gable was over briefly uh, as a Air Force uh, captain uh, flying with the, with the uh, he made a couple of missions for uh, doing pictures for the Air Force Pictorial Service. Uh, we met a lot of people in those days. If I remember right, Jimmy, um, Jimmy Stewart, he's probably retired now, but he got up to Brigadier General. That's I right. believe in the reserves. Well, he, he, he became Brigadier during the war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And later you met, once we got on the continent, George Patton. What was he like as an individual? Oh, he was a, <laughs> well, he was a character. Most of the things he said to me at one time or another wouldn't bear repeating on a <laughs> family program. Uh, he, he was he was tough. Uh, I had one uh, one real brush with with him uh, uh, during the Battle of the Bulge. The, the, the habit of the correspondence at that time. We did we did our briefing back at the headquarters, and then we got in our jeeps and went up forward wherever the action was for the day. Sometimes we'd be up there two or three days. And sometimes we'd come back at night to file our stories. And uh, this day I was on the way back from the uh, front uh, and, and uh, a long convoy. We were bouncing along a very rough road. And uh, he was a stickler for everybody always wearing a helmet, whether you were in the lines or behind the lines, you had to wear a helmet. And uh, I was had my helmet on naturally, and we hit a bump, my helmet fell off, bounced off, bounced along the side of the road and then into a field. And uh, I had our GI driver pull over to the side, and I hopped out and was going to get my helmet when I saw this, this array of signs in every known language, beware mines, Achtung meinen, you know, all, this, all over the place. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> I can get another helmet. You know? <laughs> so I got back in the Jeep, and uh, we were driving along, and there I was without a helmet on, and uh, suddenly we heard the sirens behind us. He traveled with a little convoy of his own of, of outriders four and a half and, uh, and, uh, and red lights and all this, all the paraphernalia. And here we heard them coming and the convoy is trying to separate it, let him through. And he came by us at, uh, at a, what was a fast rate of speed on that rough road, maybe 20 miles an hour, <laughs> went by. And uh, as he did, they pulled to a stop right in front of us. And this Colonel aide jumped out of the uh, Patton's Jeep. He came back and he leaned into the my jeep and said, uh, said, uh, all right, soldier, name, rank, serial number, outfit. And I said, uh, well, I'm a correspondent. And his face fell clearly. He had a disciplinary problem now. You know. <laughs> Up to that point, he's going to have me shot. <laughs> uh, no so he uh, said, well, what's your name? And I gave him my name and outfit, United Press. He said, stay here. And went back and I saw him talking to Patton. Couldn't, couldn't tell what was said, but he was saying, <laughs> we had we had correspondent on our thing. He says, <laughs> Pat. <laughs> colonel. Was, oh. <laughs> and finally, the colonel gets in the jeep and they drive off. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> Pat was very disappointed that he wasn't going to be able to hang me. <laughs> Did you ever talk to Patton after that? Oh Is yeah, I saw him quite a, quite a bit. He was a he was a. a, a a great guy for a conversation. He, he was uh, uh, quite genial in conversation. He was tough, and uh, and uh, being tough, he he uh, won the loyalty of his men to a degree that uh, was quite surprising for anybody who was such a disciplinarian. But men in combat like that, they understand that uh, that that kind of discipline leads to efficiency and uh, and uh, probably uh, success in combat and and uh, perhaps a, a safer. Well, I imagine if going into combat, you want a strong leader. You sure do. Yeah. Mm. Combat, politics, and everywhere else. <laughs> Walter, yes. Walter Cronkite is here because he and another man by the name of Ray Ellis have uh, co-authored a book. You actually wrote the text. Uh, Ray Ellis did the watercolors for this wonderful, excuse me, uh, wonderful book called West Wind. And as we go, we're going to meet Ray a little later in the program. But as we go to break, we're going to see some of the work out of this particular book. We'll be right back with more Walter Cronkite. Stay tuned.
visiting this morning with Walter Cronkite. You know, you mentioned earlier, and you talked about Jimmy Stewart and his squadron and, and trying to keep the press away from it so it didn't impair his operations. How do you feel about the press involvement today and all the information that we get from, you know, the Persian Gulf, all the information? Just one thing quickly. It, it, it wasn't impairing his operations so much as, as he didn't want any personal publicity you know, in his war effort, a much more honorable, <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. a, a reason for it. Uh, I, I'm concerned about the situation because we have de facto censorship out in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the correspondents are only permitted to go where the military decides they may go. They have to apply to go anywhere they want. Then they have to have an escort with them. They can't talk to the soldiers uh, on their own without an officer standing right there. That uh, certainly uh, limits the, the, the soldier's ability to, to, even, uh, to even, with the promise of anonymity, say what uh, he's really going through out in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, that, that's unfortunate. I've, uh, I'm for military censorship. I think we should have had it in Vietnam. Uh, there, uh, that uh, we need, obviously, to not say what our disposition of forces are, where they're being committed, how many people are involved, what our intentions are. That's military secrecy that should be preserved. Uh, but uh, we're not in that type combat situation in Saudi Arabia yet. And any time you, uh, you employ military censorship, you've got to be very, very careful it doesn't lapse over into political censorship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm afraid that some of that is involved today in Saudi Arabia. How about our situation when we were in Grenada and Panama? Was our uh, government... Terrib terribly handled. Terribly. We, we, we don't know today, really, the full Grenada story. Mm -hmm. We don't know today the full Panama story. Did we know, the full, that's, that's the, hmm? Did we know the full story in Vietnam, do you think? Oh, yes, I think you, you got do? the full story in Vietnam. Uh, 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 yes, you, you did. Uh, but now, because of Vietnam, the military is, uh, and the politicians are uh, handling their, their incursions elsewhere a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Grenada was an absolute sin against the American people. We talk about our boys, our military, our forces, our policy. Well, it is ours. It's ours in a democracy. It's not theirs. And if they're committing our boys to action and uh, endangering their lives and taking their lives, we're entitled to know everything we can possibly know about that, except just those things I mentioned a moment ago, which involve military security. And that wasn't the case in these, in these two operations. Mm -hmm. When you were on the air, as you were, you have to kind of keep your political and personal opinions to yourself. But once you retired from CBS, on your speaking tours, you became more vocal about your mm -hmm. liberal mm -hmm. feelings. Yeah. Did you have any misgivings about letting people know how you feel? No, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not ashamed of any of positions I take. In fact, I'm rather proud of <laughs> if, if it's courage uh, and, and, and uh, using it to say what I think. Well, if I think it has any effect on anybody, there's no sense in offending people if you, if you don't have a purpose to it. But uh, I, 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 my wife said I came out of the closet uh, <laughs> as a closet liberal or something. Uh, and a statement to an organization called People for the American Way uh, af shortly after the election uh, of 88. And uh, what I did there was criticize the fact that the uh, Republicans uh, had made, uh, made liberal a dirty word. And unfortunately, Dukakis had not defended his position as a liberal. He did not admit to being a liberal. Well, that's ridiculous. A liberal is a perfectly acceptable uh, political doctrine, if you please, philosophy, if not doctrine. Uh, liberal, and liberal does not mean leftist either. That's the thing that I think the opposition tried to make liberal and leftist the same word. Well, it was the L word. And it's not it so. A liberal is one, to my mind, who makes up his or her mind on the basis of the issues. Uh, is, uh, is liberal in the sense of not being doctrinaire. Uh, and if that means a little bit more to the left than to the right, but not leftist as a dirty word, 
uh, why not why not admit it uh, and uh, and uh, stand up for what you believe to be right did you ever get in a situation where because of your position you personally knew a lot of the newsmakers whether it be foreign dignitaries or presidents or politicians where either it was difficult for you to report the news about them or to be impartial in an interview with them because you knew them too well? It's a very good question, Ross. Uh, uh, subconsciously, I think that perhaps news people are inclined to, to uh, be a little less aggressive uh, with, uh, with the person they like uh, whether they're personal friends or just somebody whose persona they, mm -hmm. they like, uh, it's harder to be tough with them, obviously. It's easier to be tough with the person that you really would like to get, <laughs> if you please. But uh, I don't think that that really affects the total uh, impartiality that, that has to be applied. Uh, it, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that the good journalist overcomes that subconscious desire and and goes ahead and drives and gets what he or she wants mm -hmm. we watched you on that historic day in 1963 when John F Kennedy was assassinated can you remember that day still vividly no let me see. <laughs> no I you don't think I do remember <laughs> what happened again yes of course I remember vividly every second of it I think and the fact that you wept on the air yeah, sure, I shed a tear. I, I've, I've done that before. I've done that over dog stories. I, 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 I'm a softy in that way. But certainly over the death of President Kennedy, yeah, that was tough to, to get the words out when I had to say that officially that they had announced he was dead. I had been holding in pretty well up to that moment, and then I choked up a bit. And I, think I didn't really weep, there, but, there, but it was a... I was choked up for a second. And I think uh, all of us remember exactly where we were when we heard that story. Yeah. And you were showing the emotion all of us felt yeah. around the country and around well, the world. Well, I, I don't, I never have saw, I've seen any reason to disguise one's emotions on the air. We're all human. I, I, I think the person doesn't have any emotions is the one I would suspect. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Walter Cronkite with us uh, this morning. You have how many children? Three. And they do what? Uh, one is a uh, sort of freelance writer, and, uh, and she's a kind of dilettante uh, intellectual on Martha's Vineyard. She teaches school occasionally, works the library occasionally, and, and writes uh, up on Martha's Vineyard. I say the vineyard out here, and the people think that she's sitting along among the bunch of grapes. <laughs> <laughs> The island is Martha's Vineyard Island off of, uh, off of Cape Cod. Uh, I have a, the, my second daughter is, uh, uh, is uh, in Austin, Texas, married to a very successful lawyer there, and she also does a radio call-in talk show and uh, a television show uh, uh, once a week. Uh, she's a very attractive girl. She's been on, in movies and so forth, very bright. She has two children, and, uh, and uh, my son is in New York, He's professionally a film editor, right now the executive of a film production company that is about to do a, a videotape encyclopedia of the 20th century. Big oh. project. How did he's, you... he's married to a lovely little actress, Deborah Rush. <clears throat> Had a couple of Tony Awards and Tony nominations, I should say. How did your celebrity status affect your family? I think probably seriously. Uh, I don't know, because I don't know what it would have been like if I hadn't had the celebrity status. Uh, we're a very closely knit family, very loving family, I, I feel sure. But I don't, uh, I can't imagine it hasn't affected the children in some ways. Uh, they have had a, a life of some privilege in the sense that we 
want to go to Disney World and suddenly the public relations people are whisking us through the lines. And privileged status that, uh, that uh, is not a good idea for anybody, but uh, <laughs> if it's available, you should take advantage. <laughs> I love the honest. Oh, that's a very know. honest answer. Yeah. I think uh, I think your daughter Kathy wrote in her book about um, <laughs> it being, was wonderful being with a young man uh, sitting on the couch. It was a romantic evening. Do you do you know the story <laughs> where they're hugging and kind of nuzzling each other and you, you all... hope that's that's the whole thing. Well, <laughs> she's in the background. It's. And that's the way it is. <laughs> My father's voice on television, I can't get away from him, and it kind of ruined the moment, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. when you... Uh, well, I, I think that probably happened. <laughs> a couple of times. Your when, wife, Betsy, you and Betsy have been married how long? 50 years. This year is it yeah. 50th? Ah. <laughs> it's, it is. It's indeed something to applaud, but you ought to be applauding Betsy, right? Yeah. <laughs> she once said in, I think, a McCall's article that the, reason, that the success of your marriage was that you still laughed at each other's jokes, that you still shared well, humor. I laugh at her jokes because I have a very short memory. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard them all many times, I'm sure. <laughs> they impress me every time. She is a exceedingly witty woman. If I could just get Betsy to write, for heaven's sake. She graduated from the University of Missouri Journalism School. She was a newspaper woman, but she won't write at all anymore. And uh, if I could get her to write, I could really seriously retire. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be a great success at it. She's, she's just exceedingly witty. When you went out, when you were uh, head of CBS uh, Evening News and you were a reporter, and Walter Cronkite went out to cover a news story, did you ever find that by the fact you were there and you are of celebrity status, that you became the news story more than the news story? Was I had, that a problem? Uh, I've had to quit going eventually, particularly on political coverage. Uh, obviously, you've got something like the Berlin Wall collapsing, and you, you, you're there and you're not going to affect that event mm -hmm. very much. Uh, it overwhelms anybody's reporting. But on a political campaign trip, it got very, very difficult because you'd get off the campaign plane and, uh, and the crowd would want to gather around uh, the, the, the television celebrities aboard, celebrities, in quotes, uh, and, uh, and the poor candidate was standing there, wait a minute, hey, <laughs> here I am over here. You know? yes. uh, things of that kind. I, I, at the famous Bush-Reagan uh, confrontation and debate up in New Hampshire in the uh, 1980 campaign, a primary campaign, obviously, uh, I came in uh, a little bit late, and I was coming through the back of the hall trying to get up to the press seats up, up forward. And uh, uh, some, it was rather dark in the back of the room, and some young lady handed me, that was the other thing, you get surrounded by people and you can't do your work. You, I was trying to listen and the people trying to ask for autographs. Some very young lady handed me a piece of paper and said, would you give me your autograph? And I, uh, I scribble my name as I started to write the name. She screamed so loudly she interrupted the debate up there. Everybody looked at the back of the room as if there were an assault going on back there. And, uh, and she said, you wrote over David Brinkley. <laughs> Why don't we take a... <laughs> I just want to ask him one question right. before we go. Is it true that like hundreds and hundreds of women have written marriage proposals to you? I, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Nothing like hundreds and hundreds of... Uh, occasionally one comes through the mail. But, uh, <laughs> one, one little lady wrote me uh, uh, with a very old hand uh, wrote and sent, sent a couple of, sent some pajamas and a, <laughs> and a ring and a ticket to Frankfurt, Germany, and said, I will meet you in Frankfurt. Uh, uh, I know that you uh, would like to be with me, and I've inherited some money from an old uncle in Frankfurt, and I will meet you there for our honeymoon. <laughs> I uh, wasn't able to keep the day. <laughs> Let's meet your good friend Ray Ellis when we come back from this commercial break. Be right back. <laughs>
Joining Walter Cronkite on set is Ray Ellis this morning. All those beautiful watercolors you've been seeing as we go to break were painted by Ray. How long have you two known each other, Ray? Well, I'm starting to talk like Walter now. <laughs> So a long time. Can you tell any tales on Walter? Oh, I can tell a lot of things about Walter, but I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, unfortunately, most of them wouldn't be allowed on the air. But, uh, but I, uh, uh, I've known Walter for about 18 years, and uh, uh, doing uh, these books, I've been about the luckiest artist, I guess you can imagine, because uh, how many would uh, I know? A lot of artists I know give the right arm to sail with Walter, and and. Uh, just be his friend. He's just a great guy. So we sh should explain here, this book is pretty much, you went up to the San Juan Islands up in Washington State, and you came all the way down to Southern California, maybe Baja not, California. Not quite. We, uh, so part of that is true. We, we sailed the San Juan Islands, uh, some of the uh, southern coast of California, uh, the Bay Area, mm -hmm. but the, it's such a treacherous coast uh, going all the way, as many sailors know. Walter can get into that more than I can, but it's uh, uh, unlike the East Coast where we have little harbors and coves up and down. Uh, out there, you can get in deep trouble if you uh, uh, the weather gets bad and you can't. Who's the better sailor? Well, well, I, oh, he's I, better I sailor. sailed the I sailed the coast, the whole coast, but in sections. It's not uh, what Ray's saying. It it's not wasn't a continual trip, and we yeah. didn't make it together. Uh, that's uh, that's the difference. Oh, you did not make this trip. No, yeah. that. that yeah. The, the publicity uh, that got out, I think, represents that we did it as, as, a, as a team with our families aboard and so forth. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't take, expose my family to, uh, to the northwest coast of... Oh, I thought you were going to say to Ray. You wouldn't expose your family to Ray, but that's... A... <laughs> I wouldn't expose Ray anywhere. <laughs> do your families love sailing the way you do? Well, I think uh, most of them. <laughs> you see how we differ now? Yes. But, uh, I know Betsy loves it when the boat's put up or whatever, but, and when the sea is very calm. Uh, I have always been around boats uh, since a uh, young child, but most of the time I've been on power boats. I, did, I got into sailing about eight years ago, and I have a, a, a small sailboat, a cat boat, about a 20-footer. Walter has the real thing, about a 48-foot catch. And a, uh, it's just a great, uh, but we both love to sail. We had a great experience last uh, last week. Uh, we were down in San Diego and raced the 12 meters, and uh, that was fun. That was a lot on what fun. boat? On the USA against the Stars and Stripes without Dennis Conner. Mm -hmm. So, well, there's a question over here for uh, anybody. Jeff, I think you had one. Please stand up. I was wondering, Mr. Cronkite, if uh, you had talked earlier about uh, censorship in the news, and we've heard a lot about censorship in the arts as well recently. If you could make a comment on that. Well, yes, I think Ray would be the one to comment on censorship in the arts, since that's his uh, area of, of, uh, of particular interest. I'm opposed to any such censorship of that nature. I don't think you can have freedom of speech and freedom of press and freedom of artistic expression when you've got somebody looking over your shoulder and saying you can do that and you can't do that. That, that, that doesn't, that it's, it doesn't read. And it's ridiculous that uh, that should be the consideration. Unfortunately, as we all know, uh, money has a terribly loud voice. And uh, people who pay for and sponsor things feel they have a right to say what the product should be. Somehow or other, we've got to get over that idea in the question of the subsidization of the arts. Uh, subsidies are necessary for art, unfortunately, uh, but uh, it, it should not have a voice in what the artist does. And we'll find out what Ray thinks right after these commercial breaks. Ray, um, what is your reaction to the censorship of, of uh, art? I, well, I've, I've felt for a long time that the arts could control themselves if the media and the politicians would not take such an aggressive part. Careful. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because I think the, uh, 
uh, as an example, the Maplethorpe uh, controversy. Right. Uh, if I think they analyzed that uh, about uh, well, thousands of pe people would come in, but uh, out of a hundred and some photographs in there, they all rushed over to four photographs, and they could care less about the rest of the show. This is what the reaction was. Now, the reason uh, it got such publicity was uh, thousands of people came out to see such controversial uh, four or five uh, sexually uh, 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 implied uh, photograph. You know I what, the, Ray, that's, that's just like Yogi Berra saying that nobody comes out to Yankee Stadium anymore because it's too crowded. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that could be, we could argue that point a little later. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I really think uh, I'll, they're making much ado about, about a few things. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I think the arts have been uh, pretty well uh, pretty well controlled, uh, not controlled, but I think the exhibitions and uh, uh, museums and so forth have been uh, very good. I think a little bit in the last 20 years, a little bit lopsided. Uh, of course, my kind of art is more representational, uh, impressionist. Uh, I, for one, don't paint uh, uh, like a lot of contemporary artists do today, but I think there's a, there's a place for both. I was but just going to say there has to be room for both. Drew, you had a question. Good morning, sir. Um, yeah. I'd like to know your opinion of uh, today's so-called TV tabloid journalism and uh, how you feel about shows of that nature. Uh, I, I think they're perfectly entitled to put on a program like that if, uh, if uh, they think there's a popular appeal for such a program, and there probably is. There's always uh, the tabloid newspapers sell more newspapers usually than the serious <laughs> newspapers do as long as the management of the networks and the broadcasting stations are serious and understand that they can't replace the, the serious news broadcast. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that all, all station and network managements necessarily are that responsible anymore. Uh, I, I'd be worried about uh, their getting good ratings, better ratings than the, than the evening news does, and therefore the management saying, well, let's put that sort of thing on instead of the serious news. That would be, that would be a tragedy. Yes. Mr. Cronkite, I was wondering if you think media affects the way history is written now more than it had, say, 20 to 40 years ago. I got lousy hearing these days, and I'm afraid I didn't quite understand. Do you think that the media affects the way history is written today more than it maybe did 20, 25 years ago? No, not more than did 20, 25 years ago. Uh, always the newspapers are our current history. Uh, that is the principal source of history being written. The historians depend a great deal on what the newspapers at the time were writing. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the, the journalists, what your question I think is kind of directed at, are the journalists less responsible perhaps today than they were 20 years ago. Not at all. The journalists are probably more responsible than they were 20 years ago. They're better educated, uh, they're better paid, uh, which in, uh, brings perhaps uh, a higher type to the business. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, the basically, uh, although we're getting a decreasing number of newspapers, an increasing number of people who say they get all their news from television, which is a little bit dangerous, in fact, quite dangerous, you cannot get all you need to know from television. You've got to go multimedia. You've got to go to print. You've got to go to your newspapers. You've got to go to your news magazines. You've got to go to opinion journals. You've got to go to books to be fully informed these days. But, uh, but uh, in all of those, there are a lot of very fine, responsible journalists who are doing a good job. And we'll be right back after these messages. Spencer. Uh, Mr. Cronkite, I'd like to ask you, Lyndon Johnson once said that after you announced to the American people that the Vietnam War was unwinnable, he said that he knew he had lost the support of the American people. Did that surprise you, that the President would say something like that? Well, yes, I didn't hear that for a couple of years after that, uh, when it came out later on. Uh, but uh, 
Yes, certainly it surprised me. I didn't think that uh, I had that kind of influence on Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> he, he certainly never indicated that to me. <laughs> yes. But uh, sure, uh, uh, it, it, uh, I think that really what happened was that, uh, that it was kind of a final straw. I think that Lyndon Johnson already had decided that he had been somewhat misled himself and been misleading the American people on what it was going to take to win the war in Vietnam. And uh, the, the American people were turning against the war. I just happened to come along with my very extraordinary editorial comment uh, at that time, and it was just one more straw. Ray, uh, being great friends with Walter Cronkite, and the same for you, uh, Mr. Cronkite, what do you argue about? What do you disagree on? Because you can't agree on everything. I probably argued more on the tennis court than we ever <laughs> really? argued. Really? Yes. He would always call my shots out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one Just of those. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm the most trusted man in America. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Ray. Actually, actually, in working together, we uh, we have no really problem in, in arguing about anything because Ray does his paintings. These are Ray's books. These are a painter's book. These are books to look at and enjoy forever. Uh, the, the magnificent work that he does, internationally recognized as he is. I just do the text along with it, and uh, and uh, he does the paintings. I look at what he has painted and uh, try as best I can to uh, to augment that. Uh, I can't describe it because it's, it's, he has described it, but I augment it with a little sailing experience, and uh, and and so there's nothing to argue about. Ray, have you ever thought of doing a portrait of Walter? Of Walter? Uh, I did one of Walter's. As a matter of fact, in the first book, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a great portrait, but I did a portrait, a self-portrait, and one of Walter for the back cover, like we have on the back of this book. He did a beautiful self-portrait of himself, and I looked like a <laughs> absolute <laughs> idiot. <laughs> All right, let's just show the the uh, the cover of the book. This is called West Wind. Beautiful work in here, Ray. And then I'm going to turn the book around so we can see this. Two great friends on, uh, on the ship, uh, the, the boat, and the, doing what they love best, and that is sailing. And you have, Doris, one last question here. Would you please stand up and maybe uh, you can get some help here. Mr. Cronkite, would you please say, and that's the way it is, October 25, 1990. And that's the way it is, Thursday, October 25, 1990. <laughs> A nice hand for Walter Cronkite and Ray Ellis. Thank you for being with us. Ann and I'll be right back. Stay tuned. Our natural air conditioning on one hand and the winds of change on the other. The west wind. You never know what it will blow through the Golden Gate. It can brush your cheek with a gentle kiss or knock you down with a heavy weight's punch. That voice you know is describing more than the west wind. It is also reminding us of our past. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. He was wounded in an automobile driving from Dallas Airport into downtown Dallas. Man on the moon. Oh, boy. Thank you. Boy. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. You know, I was just looking out the window here at the St. Francis Yacht Club thinking, um, you never know who you're going to see here. I mean, 24 hours ago it was Humphrey the Whale. Today it's Walter Cronkite. Well, you see that we both are here for the same reason. I don't know why everybody's so amazed that Humphrey keeps coming back. Everybody comes back to San Francisco, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> Walter Cronkite helped us weather many emotional storms during his 31 years as a CBS News anchor. Today, he's brought a familiar topic to the Bay Area, the West Coast. With artist Ray Ellis, Cronkite sailed from Washington to San Diego in the process of putting together a book called West Wind. The big surprise to me is that uh, you can find places like Mendocino and Trinidad and think you're in uh, uh, miles and miles away, and, and it's very unspoiled. But not everything they saw was unspoiled. Our oceans are being more and more polluted. 
There, I, I'm not terribly pessimistic, however. Uh, we've got to reverse that trend and do it very quickly. We're maybe toward the point of no return for the oceans to keep them alive. But uh, I see a turning. Uh, people are becoming very aware of it. Leaving San Francisco is like saying goodbye to a sweetheart. One lingers as long as possible. As we left, uh, Walter stopped and put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know what I like best about this? And I said, what? He said, it was just two old, ugly guys sitting down talking. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't think either of you are ugly. And that's the way it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> we don't think that's the way it is. Let's say good night. Good night. Good night.